Welcome to today's channel channelings showcase and our special guest is Tracy Frederick. Welcome Tracy. Thank you. And um, I'm going to read Tracy's bio to give you a little idea about who Tracy is and who the wonderful teacher that Tracy is going to be channeling for us. So Tracy began communing with the non-physical world after hearing a voice that asked her to write a book about communicating with Jesus through friendship and conversation. And you did write that book, didn't you, Tracy? I did. I did. <laughs> <You> did. <laughs> yes. Yes. And <laughs> that book is available on Tracy's website. Uh, is that just tracyfrederick.com? tracyrfrederick.com tracyrfrederick.com um so if you listen all the way through and you like what you hear you can go there and you can download the book that uh, tracy wrote that was channel from jesus she's also a medical intuitive practitioner and she has taught herself automatic writing to connect with her friend and he often shows up in her readings with her clients She's a student in my uh, School of Intuition where she trained in medical intuition and is currently doing the Channeling the Infinite Self course. So Tracy, I'm very excited um, to speak to you and to speak to Jesus. He's also one of my favorite teachers. So this should be fun. Yeah. Before we bring him in, although I'm, his energy is here already, but um, I'd like to ask you just a few brief questions. Okay. Just to get the ball rolling and just to give everyone a chance to get to know you a little bit. Why channeling? What What is it about channeling that, that attracted you? Why did you want to learn to do it? Uh, well, I think channeling is just a formal name uh, that we give to communicating with those that are not physically here. And I was already doing it, but I didn't realize that's what it was called. And then once I started discovering that lots of people do this, well, I started feeling normal for one thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I just like it. It's, it's fun. It's easy to do. It's not hard. Um, if you leave yourself open, you can receive all kinds of messages. And yeah, it's just fun. Wonderful. And today, as we've mentioned, you're going to be channeling Jesus. And I think everybody has an idea about who Jesus is. So who is Jesus to you? Well, he's a friend. And when I received the download to write the book, uh, that was his message. I am your friend. Treat me like a friend. Um, don't put me on a pedestal. Uh, at least I fall off, is what he mm -hmm. said. Um, he doesn't want to be seen in that light. And he also explains that connecting with him through friendship and conversation um, just makes it so much easier and it takes a lot of pressure off. And um, so that's how I like to communicate with him. It's just, it's just like talking to a friend. And how has he helped you personally? Uh, lots of insight. Uh, I'm constantly asking him to teach me, to teach me what he was teaching when he uh, walked the streets, uh, what was he teaching? And just life lessons, you know, uh, he's got a bird's eye view and he's been here, so he knows all about it. And I'm just constantly asking for guidance, which I do get. And um, I try to pass that on. I don't always say that it's coming from him, but um, yeah, I just pass on what I get. And I used to always say, if you give me the wisdom and the knowledge that I seek, I will promise not to keep it for myself. And so I feel like uh, I, I want to uphold my end of the bargain. Well, you're certainly going to do that today. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. I just also wanted to just ask you um, how you've been enjoying the channeling course and what you've liked oh, about it. Uh, I love the channeling course. Um, for those of you that have not taken a course from Dr. Leslie, it's so very well put together. That's what I love about it. Uh, I like the way it's broken down to um, when you the first uh, every time we get a module, there's a explanation what all you're going to learn. I love the tools, the techniques, the um, just all the stuff that uh, goes with channeling. So and I have learned so much. I, I knew that we could channel I knew I could channel Jesus, but I had no clue that I could channel so many other beings um, of light 
And it's it's been fun and exciting to reach all these other beings that are part of our universe that we don't even have a clue about. So it's it's just a very well put together course. I can tell that you put a lot of um, thought into it. And of course you channeled it, right? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it works. Yes. Yes. And that was, that's another thing that I learned too, is, you know, I, I knew that you channeled every time you want information for this course, you channel it. And then, so I started doing that with my clients and with my work and uh, a course that I want to teach, I am channeling that information and it's, it's easy. It's easy. Yeah. So yeah, it's not hard. <laughs> it makes life easier. Yes. And so on that note, would you recommend other people try channeling? Absolutely. You know, we're already doing it. Uh, we just don't realize that we're doing it. But yeah, a, a formal uh, channeling uh, is can just take you a little bit deeper, I believe. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tracy. So would yeah. you like to get yourself into the channeling state? I would. I and would. It, it sounds like you've got um, already got a message that you'd like to start with. So I'll just invite you in your own time to deliver that message and then okay. we'll ask some questions after that okay let me get myself ready and then i'll um i'll go into his message that i got a few minutes ago okay all right i feel like i'm ready so uh i was asking uh jesus earlier uh i was just sitting here trying to feel into his energy and I was just talking and he says, uh, it's great that you prepare yourself for conversation with me, but tell the people this is not necessary in order to get my attention. Treat me as though I am your friend. Would you do all this before speaking to your friend? I should think not. And I said, but Jesus, we have to prepare our body to reach the higher level of consciousness to hear you. He said, not much longer. There is a time coming when communication is instant. I will tell you this. I tell you this so you may prepare for that day. Many of you already do this. I speak to all who call upon me. It's the listening that trips you up. I said, so how can we? How can you help us with that? Just like you would when your friend speaks to you, don't interrupt. Just listen to what is being said and take all biases out of the way. Listen to the information and allow what is being said to penetrate the place it needs to go. Some words hang on to your body. Other words merely pass through. If you do not want any disturbances in your body, then allow words that are hurtful to find a place other than your body, especially the heart. And I said, oh, wow, great advice. Thanks. That is great advice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So, are you ready for your first question? I am. I <laughs> am. By Tracy. <laughs> okay. So, let's start with some fun questions then. Um, you know, and maybe some fun questions. Oh, I, am I any good at asking fun questions, Tracy? Let's find out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. So Jesus had a fantastic sense of humor when he was alive, and he has a fantastic sense of humor now. How can he help us to have more fun and be more humorous within ourselves? Laugh at yourself. Laugh at yourself and take, uh, take nothing to heart. Lighten up your heart. Laughter is the greatest pleasure. Uh, it gives the body a sense of relief and a sense of release. Always find something to laugh about. So sometimes we have things that we find it hard to laugh about, don't we? Maybe five years in the future, we can laugh about it. <laughs> but sometimes it takes us a while to get there. So in that case, what should we do? Should we find something different to laugh about just to bring that vibration in? Uh, well, he says you can laugh at someone else's joy. You can laugh at someone else's pleasure. Uh, get your mind off of yourself. And sometimes that will help. But think of things that make you 
want to laugh, and take pleasure in other people's pleasures. So one of the things I latched onto there was um, get out of your own mind. Yeah. Talk to us about our minds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so, so you, okay. So he's saying uh, the mind can be deceiving, uh, but only if you allow it. Uh, don't allow your mind to trip you up and uh, get too much into your head. When you feel like you're too much into your head, go to your heart because that space is much lighter. The heart is much lighter. So um, does that answer your question? How can... Because sometimes we don't even know that we're in our heads, do we? Okay. So how can how can he help us know how to know that we're in our heads? Uh, be cautious about what you choose to think about. Don't be so serious, uh, and like it's like mauling mauling over the same thoughts over and over. That's getting into your head. Let the thought come in and decide if you want to bring more information in or if you just want to let it pass through. Uh, so the impression I'm getting is just let it come in, uh, but don't grab a hold to a thought uh, if you're not sure about it. If you're, if, uh, if you think it's, if you're, if you start to feel sad about something, decide if you want to be sad or if you want that to pass through. Does that help? Yeah. What about um, sometimes sadness or another emotion? It's a bit like a cloud. It arises and then it floats through. Other times, though, we have compressed emotions deep within our physical body. And those emotions are percolating to the surface for release. So... In that case, um, I guess we still want them to pass, but perhaps it's a bit different than an emotion arising in the moment. So how can he help us with those type of situations? So, for example, I mean, right now, there just seems to be a lot of people who are purging very deep things, which is taking them a little bit of time. So how can he help us? to with with emotional release like that well it is a good idea to take your time but also to lean on others that uh, have been through this situation before lean on those that you feel like you can have a conversation with as far as myself come to me uh lay your burdens at my feet and I can bless you. I see him. Um, he so he's like, I see um, like he's just giving a blessing. If you call upon him and ask him to take the burdens that you're experiencing, um, it's like he gives you an energy exchange. Um, and I just see him um, like putting his hand on someone's head and just giving them a blessing. Uh, and that's just that's an energy exchange for him. And that's how he can transfer some calming energy, peaceful energy. Um, that's what it looks like to me. Wonderful. I just laid a whole bunch at his feet right now. <laughs> <laughs> he says I take them all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. So if I ask a serious question, Jesus, I'm sure that you can really lighten it up. <laughs> I sure um, can. So here's a question. Because you were taught you were inviting everyone to lay their burdens at your feet. And there are over 2.4 billion people who call themselves Christians who have a relationship with you. And so I I wonder if you can talk about the personal relationship that each one of those 2.4 billion people has with you and how many are having a genuine relationship versus a projected relationship because the religions on our planet 
are often quite um, didactic in their teachings about you, which may or may not reflect the accuracy of your life and your teachings. So the first thing he wants to say is, it doesn't matter how you come to me. If you ask for a personal relationship with me, I will grant you that. Um, but he also, he's waving his hands like this, like he he sends out collective. And he, when I did that, it's like, I can see the energy going everywhere. And he says, I send energy out to the collective uh, to help with the planet. But anyone that calls on me, uh, I will have a personal relationship with you. Um, so I'm asking him about the religious part. So what he says about the religious part is... Um, it, it doesn't really matter if you come to me through religion, if you come to me with, with your, with your heart, I'm going to hear you. I'm going to see you. I'm going to acknowledge you. Uh, so he, he's explained to me, he doesn't get into the religion part of it. Um, it, it's, it is a personal relationship when you come, when you come to me from your heart, it becomes, that's when it becomes personal. Thank you. So did that really answer your question about the religion? Yes, it, it did really. I mean, I think because if it doesn't really matter what biases, judgments, beliefs that we have, if we're genuinely coming from the heart, then we're connecting directly with him. Yes, that's what he was trying to say. Yeah, I can see that that's a, a really good answer. Um, here's one. <laughs> <laughs> So, over time, um, oh, I've got two of them. Which one should I ask first? Over time, I've met uh, quite a few people who believe they were Jesus in a past life. I've had about three or four clients in my time of doing this work where I've had people come and say, I, I was Jesus. <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's going on, Jesus? <laughs> uh, what's going on? Um, he says they he's doing he says they are like me in one sense. Um, and he explains it this way that you know how you have a friend and you have so many similar qualities to them. It's it's like that. Um he said, I cannot say that they were me, but they have qualities and traits like me. Therefore, they they think they are me. Uh, but he says there's only one Jesus. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that makes that makes that answer makes absolute sense to me. Same thing when it comes to the apostles, you know, they each reflect different aspects of humanity and we can resonate with those different aspects because we're similar. Yeah. OK, so here's another one. Quite a few people. Channel Jesus. Some. Are fantastic an example would be the course in miracles material sometimes um they seem quite biased and judgmental and not really neutral how i perceive that jesus might be can he comment on that okay uh, i'm gonna ask it again in my mind's eye um well he says you're absolutely correct uh i cannot control the spin that some put on my words, but I, and he's doing, I speak from my heart when I speak. Um, but again, it's, it's, uh, people have their own interpretation of what I say and that I cannot, I cannot control that. But I do speak to those. There are certain ones that I know will get my message out and I do speak to them and speak through them. And then he's also telling me sometimes the publishers change the words. Like um, like in books, sometimes the publishers will change the words uh, because it helps the material to sell. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, well, talking about your words, we'd like to hear from the horse's mouth, but through Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us some of your key and principal teachings, the, the teachings that you were going from town to town, telling the people 
2000 years ago um that still apply to us today what what are those core teachings uh, the biggest thing that i was teaching was uh how to control your mind how your thoughts keep you in despair how your thoughts keep your crops from growing um and he's also saying like he had to use analogies that they could understand and that's why he used uh things about crops and he talked about sheep um he says i talked about goats and uh like he used uh those phrases and metaphors that they could understand but it was about energy control um controlling what you say controlling your thoughts and um and that was his main that was his main teaching was teaching about the energy um let me see what else was he um I, he said i was teaching kindness uh how to be kind to each other and i see uh, like people in a town that how you know certain people lived on this end of town and people lived on this end of town and they didn't want to associate with with each other but um he said i tried to bring them together to help them understand that they could be a better help to each other together versus separately. Um, and he says, uh, like uh, back then, people really wanted to be in each other's business, much like today, uh, because they had opinions of their own and they wanted to tell each other what was right and what is wrong. And I was trying to teach that, uh, let each person be an individual and let them have their own uniqueness that, um, yeah. Thank you. So I want to delve more into your teachings and your life as a, a healer. And um, Tracy had suggested that we might look at some quotes from the Bible and ask you what you really mean by them. So I've chosen a selection, um, and one that spoke to me is a simple quote. It spoke to me because um, I feel like I personally don't do this, which is let your yes be yes and your no be no. So what did you mean by that? It sounds obvious, but I feel like, well, if I have difficulty letting my yes be yes and my no be no, probably other people do too. Uh, so he's saying that that means to be firm in your decision be firm in your choices when you say uh, and it's also about giving and receiving so when you say no I can't that means no you can't and you should honor that within yourself let yes be yes uh, let no be no uh, yes I can I can help you. Uh, no, I cannot help you. But it's about your choices. It's like when you make a choice, um, honor yourself for the choice that you make. Does that make sense? Yeah. How about this one? Unless you become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, I didn't say that. Oh, <laughs> I bet there's a few that he didn't say. He's, well, when you said the word Bible, he did like this. <laughs> like, I don't know where where else, what other sources. Yeah, yeah so, I know. But but I have asked him plenty of times. I've asked him plenty of times. I will literally go through the Bible. I will pick up words that he supposedly said. And he's like, that's that's not what I meant. That's not how I said it. He keeps wanting, and again, just at this very moment, he's pointing me to the dictate. He's saying the dictators um, commanded those words to be put into that book. Um, he said, uh, I have said some of those things, many of, the, many of those things you cannot even trust that they came from my mouth. Okay. So if you want to ask me that one, what was that one again? Because it's like he kind of got off his little tangent. Do you know what? I deleted it as soon as he said it didn't come out <laughs> of my mouth. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Well, we don't have to do the Bible quotes. Um, no, I mean, I, I think, I, I think, I think, so me personally, I spend a lot of time asking him, okay. um, is this true? Is it not? So if you want to ask him, I, I don't have a problem with it. Um, I, 
it is my interpretation from speaking to him before that some of those things I did say, but, um, and it's, he's another, another thing he's saying, I can, ex I might can explain what they're trying to say. Uh, but he's also says, which I've believed this for a long time. It's the translation. Um, sometimes the translation gets mixed up okay. because it's been translated so many times. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I would advocate reading the, if you're going to read the Bible, read it using your clairvoyance. Don't read it literally. <laughs> um, okay. So the chat is, is, is uh, on fire with questions from people. Okay, let's have at it. So I like this one from Jesse. What is the silliest thing one could do in their spiritual practice? Uh, what is the silliest thing one can do in their spiritual practice? Uh, well, the first thing I heard was uh, to not believe in yourself. Um, but I don't know if that's silly enough. <laughs> okay, what's the most fun thing we could do in our spiritual practice? Oh, uh, oh. Uh, uh, so he's he's doing like this, raise the vibration, like have fun raising the vibration. I see lots of people getting together and gathering. And having a good time. It's like when you raise your hands above your head like this, um, you fill the world with excitement. And that raises the vibration for all. Uh, and he says, dance, dance around. Um, he said, it may seem silly to some, to some, but it's not a silly thing to do. Uh, yeah, and I, I see like all kinds of dancing, drumming. Um, yeah. He says the, your world would think it would be silly and it would be a mockery. Some think of it as a mockery, but it's fun. Okay. <laughs> so May would like to know, how does Jesus feel about the Ten Commandments? Uh, he showed me the number one. Uh, there's one main c commandment. Uh, and he says, I didn't write the Ten Commandments. Um, but he says there's one main commandment and he said, love, love everything, love everybody, um, love everything that everything has consciousness and love everything with consciousness. Um, he says, you just can't go wrong when you love someone and when you put forth the effort to see them for who they are, that's all you really need to do is see people for who they are. Um, yeah, just see people for who they are. Love them for who they are. Uh, love them for their unique qualities. Love them for what they can do that you can't. Uh, so the impression I'm getting is, you know, instead of being uh, upset with what you can't do or make up, uh, you know, say something because what somebody else is doing, uh, you know, it's their uniqueness. Love them for who they are. Love them if, even if they're different from you because we're all created in God's image and likeness. Misty wants to know how to change beliefs. And uh, the way she phrases it is how to change beliefs are we meant to? Are we meant to change beliefs? Is that the kind of... Well, I think maybe we'll just ask how to change beliefs. How can we change our beliefs? If our beliefs are limiting, how can we change them? Uh, open your heart and your mind to something new every single day. Uh, a belief does, uh, does not have to be like moving a mountain. It doesn't have to be something big. It can be something small. Um, so beliefs are changed when you are willing to look at a situation differently and you are willing to know that an answer, a solution can come from a different perspective. That's all a belief is, is changing a perspective. And um, he's showing me like religion. Religion says you have to believe this way. But the minute someone chooses to challenge that belief, then that belief no longer has power and hold over them. It's a matter of choosing 
to let it go. There's power in choice. So Whitney has asked a question that was on my list of questions. <laughs> okay. Um, and it was about his relationship with Mary Magdalene. Um, you know, was he a principal apostle? I mean, was she a principal apostle? And um, did he have a child with her? Okay, so as soon as you said Mary Magdalene, he's he went he goes to his heart. She was the love of my life, um, and she was uh, she was a great teacher for me, as I was to her. Um, go back to the first part of the question again uh, about Mary Magdalene. Was she an apostle? Yes, she was. Um, um, did they have a child? Uh, he says two. Cool. Um, and Whitney wants to know what modern day women can learn from the relationship between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Um, so his, when uh, you asked that, his eyes just started sparkling. Uh, and he says, uh, love, love your partner for, um, love your partner for everything that they can contribute because they are contributing to your life. Um, hold no grudges see them for who they are, love them for who they are, be kind, be giving, be, de be endearing. Um, and he says, many of you, you do, many of you are doing this. You, you do live the life, the life that me and my beloved Mary lived. So, uh, uh, and he says, and communication is the key. We communicated about everything, everything under the sun. There was nothing that we could not communicate about. Uh, share in your sorrows, share your grief, share all your thoughts, share your emotions, share everything. He says, you have, you, uh, the people on your planet have difficulty, especially the males, but uh, just as many females have trouble sharing their emotions and their thoughts um, through the condemnation and through guilt that uh, you choose not to share these thoughts and that can cause blockages in your system. He says, throw up, throw away the guilt. There's no such thing. He's like, throw away the guilt. There's no, no need to have that energy in your system. You were not given that. That is a man-made curse. So that's beautiful to hear about their relationship. In some human relationships, you might have one partner who is open to those things and another partner who is closed to those things. What do you do? Uh, those, those are your greatest challenges. And the only thing you can do and you should do is to love them in spite of. Don't forget you made an agreement and you are helping that person, even though you cannot see it by you living your life, doing your spiritual practices, you are contributing to that of the other person. And he's showing me like me and Paul, like even though he didn't necessarily get it all, um, just the being in the vibration of it uh, is helping. It's not your responsibility to help someone get on board with spiritual practices. That is not your responsibility. That is the responsibility of your partner. And they have free will to not choose that path. But do not allow it to stop you from doing what you came here to do. Do not allow it to be a hindrance. That is not necessary. It's like, that is not necessary. Keep being you. And he's also saying that sometimes that is, that is for your benefit. When a, when a partner does not completely understand, it's, it's some form of a lesson for you. It may be a lesson in control. It may be a lesson in patience. It may be a lesson in perseverance. 
but not to worry. So he talked about you have a contract. So at what point in a relationship should you walk away from such a contract? Uh, it's like, are you referring to when the contract is no longer working? I'm, like, uh, I'm like, referring to... Like the relationship is no longer working? Yeah. Um, he says, get with the elders and ask for your contract to be renegotiated. Um, there, and he's showing me like there's he's like there's many contracts. There's many contracts, and you can have another contract. Um, he says you you may call it a do over, like we might call it a do over, um, such as whenever you divorce one and you marry someone else. Um, he said that's okay. That it just didn't work. It you tried, but it didn't work. Uh, no harm. Get another contract. Ask, ask for another contract to be presented to you. And he also, it's like he showed me that on an unconscious level, it's like we re-sign contracts all the time. Like it's not a big deal. Um, he says, like when you're headed down one path and uh, when things aren't working for you. Um, it's like, I'm going to say what he calls the elders. They will step in and it's almost like they have a conversation maybe with your higher self and you renegotiate another, another contract that may work out better for you. But I see lots of contracts and um, he says it's not a right or it's not a wrong. It's just, it didn't work. Thank you. So here is another question that is a fantastic question from Laura. And Laura says, did you actually die on the cross and resurrect from the tomb? Ah, I wonder that myself. Where did you go after the crucifixion? Some say you left that land and others say you ascended to the heavens. So there's stories about him, isn't there, going to um, teach in other lands? Um, so did you really die on the cross? Uh, well, he's saying, first of all, for those, for those of you that think I died on the cross, then that's what happened to me. For those of you that believe otherwise, that's what happened to me. Uh, then he's talking about realities, di different realities happening at the same time. Um, and he said, it, so what it looks like is some people lived in the reality where I actually died, but then some lived in the reality where I didn't die. Uh, but I, I want a better answer than that. Um, he says, I was able to save myself. Um, I did I did not get up and walk out of the tomb. I had help. Um, and I've heard the story of him being smuggled out and I'm trying not to let that supersede what I'm, what he's trying to say. Um, so what happened to you? How did you get out of the tomb? Um, it looks like the tomb was not, was not being guarded and he was able to be taken out. It looks like there might have been, may have been some help from a, um, I'm going to say a Roman soldier, whatever, that basically turned a blind eye um, because he was going to get in trouble if he, um, if it was found out that he let, if he let it happen. So he pretended not to see that it was happening and so that he would not get in trouble for allowing Jesus to escape. Uh, but I see people carrying him out and like he couldn't hardly even walk. Um, so where were you taken? Uh, it looks like he was, uh, what I'm saying is he was hidden in seclusion and um, that Mary did care for him in this seclusion. Uh, he says, but it didn't stop me from teaching. It didn't, it didn't stop me from preaching. What about the Turin Shroud? What? The Turin Shroud. Uh, the Turin Shroud. Um, 
uh, I just see it being left behind. Um, you talk about the, the drapery? Yeah, um, that is, it's purported to be the shroud that he was wrapped in after death and it has the imprint of a man with wounds in the same places as yeah. was reported for Jesus. Uh, well, it looks like uh, it was left because they, it looks like he was covered in a blanket, uh, like it was left. Um, <laughs> but he's also saying like, they're making a big deal about that, but that was not, that was not a big deal. Um, it was like he needed clothing. And so there was clothing. Uh, they were prepared to rescue me. So whoever came to rescue him, um, looks like two men and looks like Mary was there. They came to rescue him and they were trying to cover him up. So um, I see like a heavy wool brown blanket um, that they used to cover him up and to protect his skin, but it was mainly for covering uh, because like if anyone saw, they wouldn't, it was just a common brown blanket, wool, wool blanket, and people wouldn't know it was him. It it almost looks like he was, he had to go through town to, uh, to, to like he wasn't put, he had to go through a town. He had to, to I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. He had to go through town. So like he might, he might could have been seen. So, um, yeah, it's just a very heavy brown wool blanket. And he said it was just left behind. Well, thank you. I think, well, I don't want to um, belabor it, but I think the idea is that people see it as evidence of his transfiguration, as his, of, of his ascension. Um, <clears throat> He says, call it what you want. It was just just a garment left behind. <laughs> so, um, who, Jesus, who were your teachers and what was their spiritual lineage? Well, he immediately showed me Melchizedek. Um, so, um, who else was your spiritual teachers? Uh, he said, so like, um, it wasn't that every teacher was spiritual in nature. It was lessons that he learned from common people. And he said, if you train your mind to understand the message behind what people say, that it, that becomes a teacher for you. That person can be a teacher for you. Um, but he does say that uh, he does looks like he went to a mystery school of some sort and where he did get formal training, but it was being out into the world where he learned to have some of his best teachers. So um, let me ask about the mystery school. The mystery school seems to, like it was in France, maybe. That's what he said, France. Um, it's in Egypt. Oh, okay. Well, something about France. Yeah, well, there are, there is stories about them, about Mary Magdalene going to France after the crucifixion um, and then to England. And there's stories about the daughter settling in England and marrying someone in England. He says that's true. So somebody wrote a book in the 1980s called... Um, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, something like that, with the notion that the um, Holy Grail was the bloodline of Jesus. Um, I read that book. I can't remember really what the storyline in it was. But I guess there's this notion that somehow there's something special about the bloodline of Jesus. Can you comment on that? comment on the special blood uh, he just says this was my destiny um but he, he did he's like i don't come from anybody famous um uh, is that what you're asking like is no um so so jesus is one of the greatest master teachers that ever lived on earth and he had two children 
and those children had children. Ah. So there is a lineage that comes from Jesus that's still alive today. There are people who are genetically related to Jesus who are still alive today. Okay. Does that make any kind of a difference to somebody if they are part of his lineage? Or are they just ordinary humans like the rest of us? Um, it looks like they're ordinary. I, I don't see where anybody looks like... So I see the line, like I see the lineage line, and I see the people. But um, it uh, it doesn't look like his children wanted to be. Uh, he said that they didn't want to be acknowledged acknowledged as um, as the children of Jesus. They didn't. They're not denying me. They wanted a more normal life. They see the way that I was treated, and they didn't want to be treated that way. So he's like, they go, they went undercover. They did not want to be treated special. Um, they just didn't want that. And it looks like uh, their mother didn't want that either. Um, it was just too hard. It was too harsh of a life to be in the limelight. Um, but I, I'm going to ask about are there others um, that are still alive today in your lineage. Uh, it seems like, you know, there's, I see a very old man with gray hair and a beard. He doesn't look like Jesus, but it feels like he's got, he, he could be like one of the last few ancestors of the lineage. Um, but again, he doesn't look like he's anybody famous. Um, and I'm asking him, does he know that he's from your lineage? And he says, probably not uh, because it's way, and it's like, I want to say like he's at the end of the line, um, so to speak. That uh, and he's doing like this. It's so so little of my bloodline. It, it just looks like. Um, well, that's you know, interesting. So that's just an interesting book that somebody wrote then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, I think it would be interesting to ask about Jesus. Um, and the, the miracles and the healings that he did so what was the key to your ability to be such a phenomenal healer uh well he when you were talking first he was immediately saying that uh miracles happen the moment you believe it's it's in the belief miracles come in the belief part it's the belief um so what was the what else were you asking about the um uh, how the was healing? he able to be such an amazing healer? What's the key? Um being a great healer. It hit the energy in his he showed me like his hands and I could see his aura. Uh he vibrated at such a high frequency that uh people were attracted. And um again, we're in when you're in a, a high frequency, you can heal. So that was that was the attraction. They wanted to be near me. They wanted to touch me. It's the high vibration. They could feel the energy. They, they, the energy itself was healing. Um, he said, for me, it was just simply a touch. It was a touch. A, trans, a simple transference, a transference of energy. Uh, but I truly cared about everyone that I touched. So it also makes me feel like... Um, he was so compassionate and that he wanted people to heal. And uh, he shows me, look, he's looking down and then he would look up, um, you know, like to God for the healing. The, the, um, and he was, he said, I was being thankful. Every time I touched someone, I was being thankful. I was being thankful. I was being grateful. Um, and, and he just, I, I just see all the compassion that he had for people for their suffering uh it, and he says it was needless suffering but they didn't know any better so that's why you have to have compassion and that's why you have to have compassion for the people that are on your earth right now they they do not realize that they cause their own suffering because if they did they they wouldn't do it they would stop it but it's been passed down for generation to generation and it's not that easy to stop so you have to have compassion for people that are suffering, people that are causing their own suffering. 
Do all people who suffer cause their own suffering? Absolutely. He says, you may not know why, but you do not have to suffer. Suffering is a choice. So how can we stop this, our own suffering? Uh, he's like, seek out a healer. Uh, seek out someone that can help you with anything that is buried deep within your heart that that doesn't resonate with you anymore. Seek out. Uh, he says, seek him. Talk with me. Talk with me about your troubles. And if it's something that's buried so deep, ask that it be brought to the surface so that you can deal with it. Create your own healing. You are, you are all powerful and you're all magnificent healers in your own right. You can't heal yourself. Amy asks, do you have any comments on A Course in Miracles? Do, does he have what? Does he have any comments on A Course in Miracles? Uh, he's, he says it's a great book and it can be challenging. It can be challenging for lots of reasons. Um, should we read The Course in Miracles? Uh, yes, you can read The Course in Miracles. Follow it to your best ability. Um, uh, it's a very good book. It's a very good way to live. I did, I did channel that book um, to. He said to the author, "I don't know who the author is, and I'm not asking." Um, it was a university professor, uh, yeah, type lady. Yes, um, he said it's a perfect way to live, but I understand that can be very challenging for each and every one of you. Read it if you if uh, if you must. It's a good book. I have another question from May, who is asking: Did Jesus and Sanat Kumara work together? Uh, did they work together? Do on they work Earth? together? Oh, do they work together? Do you... He says, "I work with many ascended masters. I am one of many." Your, um, he's wanting to say generation, uh, makes it seem like it's only me, but there's many, many more just like me. Uh, I am famous to you, but I am not famous here. Um, there's many, many that have my same type of energy um, and who have mastered their energy much like I have. Um, but we are all equal. No one is better than the other. Uh, you must understand this, that, that it is not the same here as it is on your planet. We are all equal. We all work for the greater good of humanity. Thank you. I'm going to throw in another Bible quote just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, seen as you suggested we do this. So here's one. Let's see if he rolls his eyes. <laughs> it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So that doesn't really sound to me... <laughs> did he roll his eyes Tracy no he didn't he didn't roll his eyes but he says I can explain that okay so going through the so say again the one about going through the camel's eye say that it's, one first it's easier for a camel to go through okay. the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God the reason I chose these ones about money is because um These days we're all about abundance and that yeah. we can um, all be abundant and, you know, working on not, you know, belief systems around money. And yet so well, what he's saying is like the, the rich and he was talking about, um, well, I think it relates just as much to today 
but it's like the rich people, the what those that are, uh, he says wealthy, not rich, but he used the word wealthy. Those that are wealthy do not always want to give up their wealth because giving up their wealth also means giving up control. And uh, that's what makes it very difficult um, to, he says, to spiritually ascend because you have to know at some point you are not your riches, you are not your wealth. Um, when you identify with that, instead of who you are, um, that's what makes it very difficult. So he's talking about like going through the, um, going through the eye is like back in his day, that was like ascending very, so very few people could do it because they were poor and anyone that had riches flaunted those riches and it made, it made it seem so impossible like everybody, everyone, everyone that was poor wanted to be rich and the rich could control. So it feels like it's more like a saying for back in those times, more so than a saying for today. And he says, you know, I talked in, in metaphors and analogies so that people could understand. Um, so that's what he's trying to say. It's like it was much harder for people to ascend in their level of consciousness Um the rich men because they would have to give up control and they didn't want to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, that answers both of those quotes, actually. I I want to read another quote. Um, if he said it, I'm curious what he means by it. If you want to be my disciple or anyone who wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. They must deny themselves. Uh, I don't think he said that. Uh, let me see what he's saying about that. Uh, so he's like, I don't think anyone should deny themselves in the sense that, that what that is trying to say, deny the self, um, feels like deny the ego, the ego part of the self maybe but not not yourself not your true essence of who you are never deny who you are and um no nah, i don't think he said that I, i'm just it's probably maybe. a mistranslation of what yeah it, yes it sounds like it's more mixed up he said um you know i didn't beg people to follow me they chose to follow me they wanted to learn more and they wanted to they wanted a better life it's that's the reason why they followed me they wanted to uh, well, I heard get out of their hellhole. Um, they wanted to get out of that way of living that was in such despair. They wanted, I brought hope. Um, I brought hope to them and I was training them to believe in themselves that they could do great, great things with their mind. That's what I was, that's what I was training people to realize how great they really are. And they could perform miracles and they could do miracles just like just like he could. Thank you. So we have to start wrapping up soon. So let's ask a couple of final questions. What can we learn from you today? Uh, kindness and compassion. Um, when you see someone in need, go to their aid, be kind, be compassionate, but also be kind and compassionate to yourself. You have so many beliefs, uh, lodged in your system, meaning the body. Uh, you have so many beliefs lodged in your system that aren't working for you. Um, have patience with the world, grant patience to each and every one, um, what else can we learn uh, to get out of our ju our judgmental ways? Uh, we didn't come here to judge people. We came here to love people. And he's like, that's tricky. And that's a slippery slope, you might call it. But put your biases aside and help each other. Lift each other up sing praises to each other 
And he says, many of you are doing that, but so much more is needed on your planet. Final question. Somebody in the audience has asked, do you have a specific message for those listening to this recording and listening live? Um, do you have a special message? Uh, he bows his head and thanks. Um, thanks for taking your time to be here. Um, I send love and gratitude to each and every one that is present. And I look forward to having an individual relationship with each and every one of you, if you so choose. Don't feel obligated to choose to have a relationship with me, but know that if you want to have a relationship with me, I am there. Call upon me. And he's making reference to the book, like have a conversation with me. I will talk to anyone. I will talk to the collective. I will talk to you as an individual. So he says, it's your choice. Right. I'm going to throw in one more last question <laughs> of the three last questions. Okay. Um, is there anything that he would like to say that hasn't come up because the right question hasn't been asked? Um, is there anything you want to say? Uh, he just says, don't doubt yourself. Uh, don't doubt your thoughts. Um, forge ahead. Uh, many changes are coming to your planet. You've not asked me about that, but many changes are coming to your planet. There is so much help on the horizon. Um, and I see like the, like the universe just really being lit up. Um, uh, I see the sun. I see the sun being extremely bright and yellow. Um, and he's indicating that all of these, there's so much energy being sent to us at this time to help heal each and every one of us to help to heal our planet. Um, and don't don't doubt information that you may get. It's he's also saying like um, there's much awakening going on, and it's easy to. Uh, like he's so what I'm saying is like people are going to start getting intuitive information uh, from ascended masters from angels from all of those that are trying to help us and don't doubt what you hear everyone he's like every one of you are capable of getting a message and uh, don't let anyone tell you otherwise in other words believe the messages I just feel like people are going to be getting downloads. People are going to be getting messages and um, don't let anyone doubt any of that, whatever you receive, because many more of you will be receiving. There's so much receiving to be done to your planet. Um, I also feel like, you know, again, there's so many beings um, sending energy our way. Um, yeah. There's something else I was going to say, but I could just, I had to see all the energy being sent to us. Uh, he says, there's much hope for your planet. Do not live in despair. Uh, always have hope. Uh, increase your faith. When you have doubt, increase your faith. And he's like, call upon me. And he pats his chest. And he says the many others. I could go on forever having this conversation. I will throw one more final question. <laughs> Okay. And then we must stop. Okay. It, when you were talking, it just made me think about, um, you know, the stories of, uh, you know, his time in the desert, the most challenging times of his life. And many people on earth now are going through such challenging times. How did he get through? And what can we learn from his experience so that we can get through? Uh, he says perseverance. Um, he shows me a quote that I look at in the Bible all the time, which is uh, when you are not welcome somewhere, dust the sand off of your feet and, and continue to go on. He says, I did say that. He said, um, it doesn't matter what other people believe about you. He said, I had, he's like, I had to stand in my own right. I had, I knew who I was. I had, 
confidence in who I was. And I didn't worry about those that didn't believe in me and what I had to say. Uh, he says, much like a water rolls off a duck's back, at some point you have to you have to let things uh, not stick to you. Uh, just keep keep persevering, and you know people will see by the example that you lead. If you continue to lead your life in the way that you feel led to lead it in, people will see you as a shining example, and that's the best thing you can do for all of the people around you is to can you continue to be the shining example and putting out the good works that you do. Thank you so and, much, Tracy yeah. and Jesus. <laughs> he he, he must, bows and says, um, you're most welcome. We must end. Yes. Unfortunately, it's yeah. a bit of a whirlwind. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Tracy. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. He's definitely got some high energy there. Yes.